Here we are at the graveside of Casper Borer uh, of the 107th Ohio. Uh, what's his story? Private Borer was one of those soldiers who also didn't ask, at, did not answer the call to duty back in the great flourish of patriotism back in 1861. Mm -hmm. He waited until September of 1862 to enlist. Sure. And he enlisted in the 107th Ohio Infantry. The 107th was one of those so-called German regiments. Right. Raised in the area around Borer, Cleveland, okay. Ohio. Mm -hmm. And uh, many of the uh, soldiers with whom he served had decidedly ethnic German names. And right. uh, it was a regiment that was known where uh, an awful lot of the soldiers spoke German to each other just casually in, in everyday life. Sure. Um, Caspar Borer left a fairly lucrative um, occupation behind. He was a chair maker, mm -hmm. and apparently a very good one. Splendid. Because he uh, contributed to his parents' uh, care by giving them a, a, the sum of $200 every year. Oh, now, wow. Now, that's some that serious is, money back in, yeah, 18, that's back a big in the deal. Civil War era. But it would be that contribution of $200 that was going to make the application for a pension uh, a lot more easy for, for his parents later on. Sure, so like proving dependency, basically, Absolutely. I see. Um, because it was so well documented that he was a very good son. Right. Well, during the fighting in the Battle of Gettysburg, probably on the first day, when the 107th is pulling back from the area around Barlow's Knoll, uh, Casper Borer was hit not just once, but twice. Mm. Once was in the lower leg, uh, the r lower right leg, and amputation would be a result of that. But he also got hit in the side. Ooh, yeah. And when you have a, an injury to the trunk as well as to the leg, uh, the prognosis is not good. Yeah, it starts to get a little bleak. It, it takes, uh, he'll, he'll fight for as long as he can, but in the, the middle of July, his, uh, he'll basically die of exhaustion mm -hmm. after going through as much as he has. He was initially buried on the grounds of the George Spangler Farm, mm -hmm. and in time, his remains would be brought up here. Um, back home, the Borer family no doubt felt the loss, but they were also the kind of family that did not like to rely on the help of others. They always liked to tough it out and see it through. His mother's name was Apollonia. Apollonia. And it's a lovely name. It's a lovely name. And she was pr apparently quite a tough character because she didn't want anybody feeling sorry for her or anything of the sort. Her husband was an invalid. He'd suffered from a hernia for almost 11 years, and he was incapable of doing any hard physical labor. Sure. So a lot of it was simply up to her to keep the family together. Well, Apollonia tried as hard as she could to keep things going until finally she simply said, I can't do it anymore, and began the process of applying for a dependent mother's pension. But she didn't start the process until 1868. Oh, wow. So for five years, basically, uh, or four years or so, she she tried to, to make it on her own. Mm -hmm. In the application uh, for, for the pension she put forward, she made it clear that they had tried everything they possibly could to keep going without uh, falling back on government support. Sure. They had done all the paperwork to get his back pay and any bounty or any monies that were legitimately due him so it wouldn't be considered charity. Mm -hmm. They had um, set up a, a small business where even as an invalid, uh, Casper's father started uh, repairing boots and shoes. Mm -hmm. And they raised a small vegetable garden and sold them uh, the, the, the vegetables right out of the garden to anybody who would buy them. You saw, I saw incredible effort on in, in the part of this family to try to keep it all together without relying on outside support. Sure. But at a certain point, everybody needs some help. Right. And she will finally apply in 1868 to get the support that the family desperately needed and that their son had earned for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, what an incredible, you know, American story, especially for, you know, family that immigrated to the country of, you know, really pulling yourself up mm -hmm. by your bootstraps kind of thing. Um, and, and, you know, certainly being buried in a national cemetery um, makes it as American of a story as it's, it's possible for there to be. Um, and the chances are very good that Apollonia and her husband never got a chance to come here and visit the last, mm. uh, his, his last re resting place. It was just so hard to keep everything together as it was. Uh, a chance to come here and pay final respects would have been a luxury that they likely never 
uh, we're able to afford. Right. Now, I just quickly want to touch on something you've mentioned before about beginning the process and applying for a pension of any kind truly was a process. I wonder if maybe you could just speak a little <laughs> bit to that. Uh, the process, uh, well, first of all, under the legislation of July of 1862, creating what was called the widow's pension, there were separate categories. Mm -hmm. uh, you could be a widow. You could be a dependent mother. And the language in the original law was very specific. It says dependent mother. Mm -hmm. There was nothing in there for dependent fathers. Mm. And in some cases I've seen, uh, when the mother perhaps had passed away and the father really was dependent on his soldier son pay, uh, an attorney would simply come in, cross out mother, put in father, <laughs> and then proceed. And oftentimes that worked too. Oh, wow. Um, there were minors pensions. In some cases, there is going to be a father who goes off to war where the mother is deceased or has left the family or something like that, uh, where the father has uh, assigned a guardian to the kids and then the father goes out and gets killed here. Uh, the, the guardian can then apply for a minor's pension mm. that covers their care until the kids are 16. Sure. Government efficiency is not usually something we have good things to say about, <laughs> but the one part of the whole pension process that seems to have been very efficient was the government knew when every child who was getting a minor's pension was going to reach 16 <laughs> because your payment stopped on the last day you were 15. Sure. And, and the records are very clear about that. Um, you could also get uh, one of these widow's pensions if you were disabled in service. If, you, if your soldier died of disease and not in battle, you could still apply for a widow's pension or a dependent, sure. pe uh, a dependent parent's pension. But no matter which kind of pension you wanted, there were certain things that you had to do. Number one, you had to verify that the soldier was in fact a formally enlisted and mustered in soldier in the United States service. Right. Uh, paperwork being what it is, um, sometimes that paperwork didn't exist. Sometimes, uh, here at Gettysburg, we ran into situations where a soldier enlisted in a two-year regiment that mustered out at Chancellorsville a after Chancellorsville in May, and then they got transferred to another regiment to finish out a three-year uh, term of service. And sometimes the paperwork didn't get, didn't never caught up with the new regiment. It was stuck in the records of the original regiment in which right. he served. And that would just mean that a widow or a mother is just going to be waiting and waiting and waiting until the government figured out what the problem was. Right. Um, so the first thing you had to do, which sounds so simple, verify service, could be a real problem. Absolutely. If you were a widow, you had to prove, in fact, that you and the soldier were married. Mm -hmm. And in a time before uh, marriage certificates were routinely issued, that could get pretty problematic in a hurry. Sometimes you could get a cert certificate from the Justice of the Peace, if that's what the way it happened. If you got married in a church, oftentimes church records would have it. Sometimes they would accept a family Bible entry, hmm. but your marriage better not be the most recent entry. There better be something under it to right. prove, in fact, that you uh, got married back five years ago or something like that. Where it got really inter interesting would be in cases of foreign-born soldiers, where perhaps there was a marriage certificate, but it was over in Germany or back in Ireland at a small parish church, or up in Canada and written in French or something like <laughs> Heaven that. Heaven forbid. And the State Department would actually have to step in and right. help some of these uh, widows or dependent parents get the paperwork that they needed. Um, if there were children involved, you had to prove, in fact, that you were the parents of them, and that oftentimes meant producing either a birth certificate, wasn't, which wasn't routinely offered, or a baptismal cert certification by a local church. And God forbid if the child's name and the record differ in Ooh. any way. Yeah. Uh, one letter off could result in a denial of payment. Um, the, other big, the other big thing you had to do was to prove your loyalty to the union. Right. You had to make sure that you had never spoken out, written a letter to the editor, done anything to support the Confederate cause. That was usually the easiest thing to check off. Sure. But every step had to be taken care of before uh, the uh, pension would be granted. Mm -hmm. For the private soldier in the ranks, like uh, Casper here, the payout would be about $8 a month. Mm -hmm. um, in 1865 or 66, they allowed for an additional $2 per child up to the age of 16 right. per month. Um, if you were a higher ranking officer, 
uh, like if you were a lieutenant or so, you might get seventeen dollars a month sent mm -hmm. home. Uh, a colonel could get thirty dollars a Ooh, month sent my home. goodness. So it was a sliding scale. But this was the first time that we had something that today we would recognize as survivor benefits. There had been one or two times earlier in American history when the veteran himself could get a payout, especially for uh, captains of naval vessels, hmm. because the assumption was since they were usually out at sea, they hadn't usually been able to establish a homestead and a family and had nothing else to fall back on, so they could get an, a, a, a payout. But when he died, the payment stopped. Mm -hmm. In these cases, the payment continued until the uh, person receiving the payment uh, died or, in the case of uh, widows, uh, remarried. Mm -hmm. Thanks for going into that. I, I wanted to just highlight that it really was a process, oh, and yeah. sometimes this could take years to verify all of these things. Oftentimes, uh, it required the services of an attorney. Uh, it's, it's interesting if you re when you re re um, review some of these files to see paperwork with official forms where the different blanks have been filled out, but then you get to the bottom and you realize that the, the mother or the widow has not actually signed it. It's marked with an X. Hmm. That in fact they were uh, illiterate, right. but they required legal help to actually fill out the paperwork. Mm -hmm. uh, I've seen ads in certain big town newspapers where attorneys will offer their services to help oh, uh, wow. help families through this. Mm -hmm. But the, probably the most important or the most interesting thing here was to me that a family had to start the process themselves. Hmm. Today, when one of our service our service personnel uh, gets killed in action or dies in the service of the country, the family will get a visit from the armed services. There will be a casualty assistance officer um, supplied to the family to work you through every bit of the process. Um, there is no question that a family today would get this support. But for a Civil War family, there was no knock on the door. Hmm. There was no visit from anybody from the War Department or the United States Army. You had to know that this support was out there, and you had to start the process. Wow. And while if you lived in a big city, the chances were reasonable you'd know about it, if you're in a small town in Wisconsin or upstate Maine, you might never even know that, that wow. this uh, opportunity existed. That's wild. And it's totally on you. That's tough. And just uh, an added layer, of course, that all these families here in the National Cemetery have to deal with. So. Um, thank you for going into that process and kind of uh, breaking it down for our, our viewers here. That's uh, poignant, intense, and, uh, and, and, and more. And we're really just learning about the existence of these widow's pensions. Mm -hmm. One of the great boons to those of us who do Civil War research is uh, the internet, Right. frankly. Absolutely. And uh, an awful lot of these uh, pension files that have been, um, that were successfully concluded are now digitized and available for us to go and just learn so much more mm -hmm. about the richness of the soldier experience during this time. Right, and, and those are through the National Archives, is that right? Yes. Okay, got it. So if you all want to go check that out, that's where, that's where you'd want to go. Well, with that, I think we'll go ahead and move on to our next, our next story here. Okay.